Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this morning is taken from our Gospel lesson from Luke chapter 12, especially the 51st verse, in which Jesus says, Do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. This is the text. Dear brothers and sisters in the Lord Christ Jesus, Peace and unity are two of the chief values recognized and prized by our world today. It's a cliche that when Miss America is asked what's most important to her, the answer always involves somehow world peace. A world without war, in which we can all just get along, is assumed to be everyone's ideal, everyone's goal, everyone's fervent desire. And as Christians, aren't we looking for the same thing? Aren't peace and unity Christian values? Well, in a sense, yes. We just sang about peace and unity. O comforter of priceless worth, send peace and unity on earth. We've just prayed the Holy Spirit for the blessings of peace and unity. Jesus himself says in John's Gospel that he leaves peace with his disciples and with us. And he prays in that same Gospel that his disciples and we with them would be one. Peace and unity are certainly defining goals of the Christian religion. So we should get along just fine with the world around us, right? After all, we all want peace and unity, just like the world wants peace and unity. We all want conflict to cease, and we all want to be united in love with everyone. But as it turns out, peace and unity as we understand it are very different from peace and unity as the world understands it. That's why Jesus at the same moment when he leaves peace with his disciples says to them, not as the world gives, do I give to you? And that's also why in our text, Jesus actually says, Do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. So how can Jesus say that? Wasn't peace on earth announced at Jesus' birth? Didn't John the Baptist come to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, establishing peace and unity? in preparation for Jesus' coming? How can Jesus, our God of love, say that He comes to bring not peace, but division? And not just division, but division even within households. Division between father and son. Division between mother and daughter. Division between mother-in-law and daughter-in-law. Aren't we Christians supposed to be all about family values? How can Jesus bring such division. Well, as with so many seeming contradictions in Holy Scripture, we need to see in what sense and in what respect Jesus is using certain words. See, a word can be true in one sense and false in another. True in one respect and false in another. I think one of the primary examples of this is when we consider the relationship of Jesus to his Father. There are places in Holy Scripture where Jesus says that the Father is greater than he. And yet we know that Jesus, as the Son of God, is perfectly equal with God the Father. So how can they both be true? Well, each is true in a different respect. Jesus is less than his Heavenly Father with respect to his human nature. But he's equal to his Heavenly Father with respect to his divine nature. So many things in Holy Scripture are like that. They seem to be contradictory to one another, but when we consider the sense, and when we consider in what respect each thing is being said, then we find that all of Scripture agrees quite nicely. And that's true in this case as well. We need to think about peace with whom. Does Jesus bring peace? Or does Jesus bring division? That depends on what respect peace is being used. 
If it's peace with God, then yes, Jesus comes to bring peace. If it's peace with the sinful world, well, then Jesus brings only division. See, peace with God is division from the world. Jesus brings perfect peace with God, but he brings only division from the sinful world around us. When we understand that, we begin to see that it's not enough to speak about peace and unity in and of themselves. We need to know with whom we are to have this peace and unity. When it comes to peace and unity with the world, that is forbidden by God. But when it comes to peace and unity with God, our faith in Jesus Christ gives us abundant peace that will last forever. See, Jesus brings perfect peace with God, perfect oneness, perfect unity with our Heavenly Father. And that's the peace that really matters. It's the peace that Holy Scripture holds up for us as the blessed fruit of faith in Jesus Christ. Now, it was necessary for Jesus to bring peace with God because we are not by nature at peace with God. Of course, we all want to believe that we are at peace with God. When a sinful child of the world goes to one of our natural parks, like Sleeping Bear Dunes, where I got to go this past week, beholds the beauty of God's creation, it's easy to feel a sense of peace with God. To believe that God has nothing but wonder and majesty and beauty in store for us. And when men come along telling us that all is peace and love, their message resonates with us. In fact, preachers of peace tend to be far more popular than preachers who point out our lack of peace with God. But just because something is popular doesn't make it true. As God warns through his true prophet Jeremiah, the false prophets who downplay God's wrath have healed the wound of my people lightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Now, a false peace is more dangerous than open war. Much of Holy Scripture is dedicated to exposing the false peace set up by our deceptive hearts, which want to be at peace with God without submitting to God's law. In fact, it is the duty of a Christian preacher to preach God's law in all its terror so that our enmity with God can be recognized and addressed. As St. Paul points out, we sinful beings are by nature at enmity with God. Children of wrath, he calls us. The law of God brings that wrath and enmity out into the open so that it can be addressed and address it has been. How does God address our warfare and enmity with Him? Through the blood of Jesus. St. Paul says that through Jesus, God reconciled to Himself all things, making peace by the blood of His cross. Now, doesn't it seem strange for God to establish peace through something so violent as the blood of a cross? The language of blood isn't peace language, and yet it is through the violence of the cross that God reconciled us to himself. By making war with his own son on the cross, by killing him, and with him the sin that Jesus had taken upon himself, God established peace with us sinners. And that message of peace is preached to all the world. And those who believe it and who repent of their sins against God and against His law will have perfect peace for eternity. To them can be said, peace, peace, and there is perfect peace through the blood of the cross. And by bringing us perfect peace with God, Jesus brings us perfect peace with one another. When St. Paul writes about Jesus bringing about reconciliation through his cross, he speaks not only about our warfare with God, but about the peace of Gentile with Jew, of one believer with another. We've all been redeemed by a common cross, and we all submit to a common law. 
So we have no basis for disagreement as brothers and sisters in Christ, no cause for enmity with one another. All who believe in Jesus Christ are forever united in Him, destined for perfect peace in the life to come. But by bringing us peace with God, Jesus actually makes us enemies of the world from which we've been called. Jesus brings peace with God, but He brings only division from the world. We who have been called to peace with God are divided from those who are not at peace with God, who do not submit to God's law, and those who do not believe in Jesus. This division reaches down into even our most intimate relationships, setting families against one another. It's a sad fact of life in this sinful world, but it's a fact that we have to realize. We are divided from the world around us, which does not submit to God's law. Now that may be the most visible division. It's one that we can readily see all around us, and that division is mutual. We preach judgment to the world for its sin, and the world responds with hatred toward us and toward our God and His law. Now, as forgiven sinners, taught and humbled by His law, and aware of our own sin and weaknesses, we still look with disapproval and with distress on the impenitent sin of those in the world around us. We see a world in which marriage has been thrown out the window, where couples live together for convenience sake and not in a lifelong covenant of marriage, where our institutions recognized as marriage what God calls an abomination. We see a world in which life is cheap, in which infants in the womb are seen as impingements on the rights of women. We see a world which has service to the neighbor replaced with service to the self. And as Christians who strive to live according to God's law, we feel out of place, truly strangers in a strange land. We preach repentance. We try to call the world around us away from its madness and its march toward everlasting death. And we are rejected and we are hated. There can be no peace with such a world, only division. And Jesus brings that division. But there's another deeper division that we don't always see. We are divided from those who do not believe in Jesus. We're divided from those who have openly chosen other paths to salvation, other gods and other systems of belief. But we're also divided from those who claim an allegiance to Christ, but don't put their supposed faith into practice. We who live from the gospel of forgiveness in Jesus Christ are forever divided from those for whom sports and activities and relaxation and convenience are more important than gathering to hear the Word of God. We're divided from those who profess faith in Christ but count their family ties as more important than their ties to God. Even if we don't see our division now, it will be revealed in the life to come. Now, this series of divisions that Jesus brings may seem to be a matter of us versus them, but lest we be deluded into thinking that our division from the world can be safely ignored, can be shoved off to the side while we live blissfully in our sheltered church society, Jesus brings division disturbingly close to home. The division that Jesus brings doesn't just separate nation from nation or congregation from congregation. Jesus cleaves our very households and families in two. The division between believer and unbeliever, between saved and unsaved, separates father from son, mother from daughter, mother-in-law from daughter-in-law. As important as the bond is between close family, infinitely more important is the bond that unites us to our God in Jesus Christ. Jesus forever separates us from our closest family members, our parents, our spouses, our children, if we are not united with them in a common faith. So let that teach us what our attitude should be toward the world from which Jesus divides us. Being divided from the world doesn't mean that we don't love the world. We love the world as we love our own family knowing that we have been called to salvation from the world only through the grace of God in Christ. And what is more, by calling us out of the world, God has called us to be His means of saving the world, of bringing His gospel of reconciliation into the world that more may be saved from it. 
division from the world doesn't mean leaving the world to perish. The whole reason that Jesus came to die for the world was that God loved the world. And we are called to love the world too, and to give of ourselves by calling this world to repentance, and holding before the world the saving word of life in Jesus' name. In the end, our division from the world will be total and eternal. When we depart this life in the faith, we will be divided from the unbelieving dead by the great impassable chasm that separated Lazarus from the rich man. And when Jesus comes again, we who believe and repent will inherit the kingdom prepared for us from the foundation of the world, while those who do not believe and who refuse to repent will be cast into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. That's a painful truth, painful to God and painful to us. But that doesn't make it any less true. Where our hope lies is in the power of God to unite. The power of God to reconcile by His Spirit. The Jesus who came to bring not peace but division is the Jesus who gave Himself on the cross for our salvation, making peace by the blood of His cross. Peace with God may mean division from the world, but we have been divided from the world so that we can forever enjoy true peace and true unity with God in Christ. That's the peace that Jesus gives, the unity that He brings about. And it's a precious gift, more precious than anything else we can imagine. And that gift is freely ours through faith in Jesus Christ, our Savior from sin and death, and our gracious Lord for eternity. God grant that through His Word which He has entrusted to us, the full number of His elect may be called out of this sinful world, divided from sin and united to God forever in peace. And God grant that the peace of His Son may be ours forever. Amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.